Well, I, for one, refuse to say Christmas is over. So Christmas is not over. Um, Merry Christmas! Christmas. And Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you for being here. This is a combination uh, worship service today. Um, Highland, uh, First Lutheran and Sherman, and Jasper ELC. It's great to have you all here today. My name is Jim Erickson. I should not assume that you all know me, but this uh, was my church for the first, well, 20-some years of my life. This is where I grew up, running up and down these halls when I shouldn't have been, and other halls with uh, Curtis Johnson and, and other suspects. And uh, I, this church had a great impact on me, and I didn't even know it was happening. That's the beauty of church, especially for little ones. But it continues through all of our, all of our lives. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Grace and peace to you from God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I was just going to to say this to you, but I'm going to sing it, so I apologize in advance. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Seventh day? Seven swans of swimming? Yes, that was the gift. Seven swans of swimming. Seven swans of swimming. Now there is something I would never ask for. Seven swans of swimming? Oh, how thoughtful. Thank you very much. How long does it take to bake a swan, by the way? No one knows. I don't think anyone's ever done it. Today is the seventh day after Christmas. Now, which do you prefer, the seventh day before Christmas or the seventh day after? Everybody wants the seventh day before. You don't want Christmas to be over. Retailers, on the other hand, sure like the buildup to Christmas. In 2022, retailers in the United States generated $936 billion from all of you, and a little bit from me. And that was just in two months, in November and December. That is just a few billion shy of a trillion dollars. Not bad for a timid spending year. And that is the adjective that this article used to describe, to describe people's spending. Timid. Timid. A timid trillion? It's an oxymoron, if ever I've heard one. So let's jump to charitable giving in 2022. It happens to be an industry, a responsibility that I am a part of. Just shy of $50 billion were donated in 2022, and that's for all 12 months. I helped generate 0.01% of that amount. That's not a lot, and I'm still employed. It's a very humbling number. So how much was given to churches? I know you're all curious. That is not an easy number to find. One site said $144 billion was given to Christian churches in 2022. Again, 12 months. This is not a stewardship message for Jasper ELC or Highland or First Lutheran in Sherman. I just want to highlight what has happened to our hearts and to our pocketbooks in our efforts to celebrate the Bethlehem baby. $1 $1 trillion in retail spending, $500 billion in charitable giving, and $144 billion given to the church. That's quite a disparity. I don't think $1 trillion in retail spending is what God had in mind when, as the Apostle Paul wrote to his letter, in his letter to the Galatians, the time had fully come, and God sent his Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Now we know Jesus was born of a woman. The original uh, Apostles' Creed and God's Word, our Bible, tells us Mary, who was a virgin, conceived and gave birth to a son. That is a very important point to make. If we don't believe the virgin birth then what are we doing here? We're all just walking on a treadmill, going nowhere fast. So what's all this born under the law business? Well, Jesus was a Jew. And nobody does law like Old Testament Jews. God gave us ten commandments, ten laws to live our lives by, and Pharisees, Sadducees, and high priests of biblical history, they added hundreds more. 
They added so many laws that being a law-abiding citizen was impossible. There was no way you were going to abide by them all. Jesus was born in Bethlehem to an unwed mother. That's breaking the law. Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. Those of illegitimate birth and their descendants for ten generations may not be included in the assembly of the Lord. I don't like that law. And thankfully, Jesus came to fulfill it and say it is no longer a law. I guess the anonymity of the babe's delivery in that small town stable allowed that offense to be overlooked. Nobody cared about that baby in the stable that night. But from there, the law was adhered to by Mary and Joseph, and it was adhered to by the letter. Luke 2, 21. On the eighth day, the baby was circumcised. That is an absolute must for a Hebrew baby boy. Circumcision was the order of the day since God told Abraham to perform the procedure on every man in his household, in, in his household his family, and his servants. This would be physical evidence of the covenant between God and his people. That covenant would include, that circumcision would include all of Abraham's descendants way back then and those Jews and Hebrews today. Okay, circumcision, eighth day, check. Got that one done. So what's next? The boy was named and consecrated, consecrated to God that day even though the angel had named him before he was even conceived. So the name, Jesus, Yeshua, Emmanuel, God with us. Child named, check. The third law to be obeyed, purification. A Jewish mother had to wait 40 days before she could enter the temple to present her firstborn son to God. That law comes to us from Leviticus chapter 12. Purification of the mother, check. Next, well, there's a lot of stuff to do before when you bring your kid to the temple. Next, a sacrifice must be made. Since the young couple is obviously at or near the poverty level, they are allowed to make a more affordable sacrifice. The lives of two doves or two pigeons, and they would be purchased inside the temple courtyard by these money changers with the tables that Jesus, 33 years later, would overturn. That law also appears in Leviticus chapter 12. A pauper's sacrifice. Check. Well, things are going swimmingly well. All the boxes for a new Hebrew baby boy are checked. In two shakes of a lamb's tail, they'll be back in Bethlehem waiting for the Magi to arrive, and then they'll prepare to hightail it to Egypt to avoid Herod's jealous rage. A rage making sure a toddler would not be the next king. Every child under two would be killed in Bethlehem, so says Herod. But before all of that happens, something else happens in the temple. An old man, moved by the Holy Spirit, approaches the young family. He takes the baby Jesus in his arms and he praises God. And before Mary or Joseph can even consider denying this, this child to this old man that they don't know, Simeon speaks to God about his own future, Simeon's future. He speaks to God about the future of the child, Jesus. He speaks to God about the future of pagan Gentiles and also the future of God's chosen people, Israel. Simeon cries out in prayer, God, Sovereign Lord, you promised I would see your salvation before I died, and I have. You can now dismiss me in peace because I have seen your promise with my very own eyes. This was your plan for all people, Gentiles and Jews alike. This child is a revealing light of your power and your promise to the Gentiles, and he reveals your glory once again to your people, Israel. Mary and Joseph marvel at the words of Simeon. And then Simeon turns to Mary and he tells her, this child is destined to cause the fall of some and others to rise. He will be spoken against by those who don't want their thoughts revealed. He will be spoken against by those who don't want their hearts opened 
And a sword, a sword will pierce your own soul too, Mary. Because we know now what Mary did not know then, her soul would be pierced when she would see her son whipped, beaten, and nailed to a cross. His side would be pierced as well, just to make sure he was dead. Rare is the mother who isn't pierced when her child is hurt or worse. A sword will pierce your own soul too, Mary. Mary would need a savior too. Just then, an elderly woman named Anna draws near the wide-eyed family and thanks God for this child. Anna heard everything Simeon had to say about this infant. God's glory was shared by Simeon's words. And Anna believed instantly. She became an early evangelist, telling everyone within earshot about the child and the redemption for Jerusalem. Over 2,000 years have passed since Simeon and Anna blessed that child. You might agree the excitement has waned since God sent his son, born of a woman, since God sent his son, born under the law. If we show excitement, it is generally kept well contained inside our religious humility. We will stand and scream for zillion dollar football players. We'll raise our excited voices at practically any competition we spectate whether in person or on TV. But this Jesus business, well, that's, that's okay for in here, but we'd rather turn our conversations to the weather or to financial forecasts when we meet for coffee elsewhere. I may sound a bit judgmental and pessimistic, but that's because I'm, kind of, I'm slightly judgmental and slightly pessimistic. I do these same things, but I'm trying to break free of that unwritten law that says... Thou shalt not speak of Jesus, lest it be in a formal religious setting. That is not a law. I long to have more evident excitement for this baby who was sent, this baby who was sent to pay for all of my sins with his life. I want to be more like Simeon. I want to, I want to share more willingly like Anna. And it should be easier than it is, especially when we read the end of today's verses from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatian church. Paul writes, and you just heard this, but I'm going to say it again. Because you believe, you have become his children, and God has therefore sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. And now you can call God your dear father, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave to sin and worldly temptations, but have become God's own child. And since you are his child, everything he has belongs to you. Of course, we're talking about God's kingdom, not material things. The law tells us, you sin, therefore you must pay the penalty, which is death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life through the baby born of a woman. Eternal life through the baby born under the law. Eternal life from the baby born to redeem those under the law. That's all of us. Jesus, Emmanuel. The excitement for the retail form of Christmas is worth almost $1 trillion in a two-month period. The excitement for the charitable form of Christmas is worth half of that. The amount we dedicate to God's churches is 11.5% of that which we spend on each other. Sobering, isn't it? I had to use a calculator for all of that. What if all of this was upside down? What would the world look like? We may never know. Materialism and selfishness are alive and well. So for today, for tomorrow, and for all the days left in our lives, let's consider first 
the expense God went to to save us from ourselves. He arrived as a baby. He grew up knowing the love and discipline of human parents. He traveled extensively on foot. He had friends. And did he ever have enemies? He breathed air. He drank water. He ate food. He likely had calluses on his hands. He taught lessons people didn't want to learn. He was arrested for speaking the truth. He was beaten because he refused to cave to those who would do anything in their power to keep their power. And that included killing him in a horrendous way. He was attached to a cross to suffocate and to die. He did all of these things for one reason, for you. That's the value of your life to him. Jesus, our suffering servant, lived and gave his life to show you that you are invaluable to him. A trillion dollars? A mere pittance compared to what he paid for your salvation and for your eternal life. Don't ever stop celebrating Christmas. Celebrate before or after. Celebrate in July if you want. Just celebrate the Savior we have been given. Jesus is the gift you don't have to unwrap. You can't pay for this gift. You can't work for it. It is the perfect gift. In fact, this gift is just what God wanted you to have for Christmas. Enjoy it. Praise God for it. And live eternally because of Him. Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. These uh, prayers are based on Psalm 63. O oh God, You are our God. Earnestly we seek You. Our souls thirst for You. Our bodies long for You in a dry and weary land. We have seen You in the sanctuary and have beheld Your power and Your glory. Creator of all that is. We thank You for calling us to worship You. We thank You for this church where so much life has happened and so much life has been celebrated. We ask You, Lord, to strengthen Your church through each one of us. We were created to worship You and to serve each other. When we don't, there is a dis-ease within us. Heal our selfish hearts and place a longing to praise You and to join in fellowship with one another in Your name. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. Because Your love is better than life, our lips will glorify You. We will praise You as long as we live. And in Your name, we will lift up our hands. Father God, we thank You for the promise of a blessed future through the arrival of new life. Thank You for babies and for all of the ways you show your love for us as we grow and age. Thank you for the blessing of this nation. We, we pray, dear Lord, that you will guide our leaders in ways that you would have them follow. We thank you for farmers who produce our food. We thank you for companies that make it available on store shelves. We are grateful for abundance and ask you to provide for those who experience want. Thank you for protecting us from those who long to harm us. And thank you for those who serve in our armed forces as part of that protection. We are grateful for, emer for our emergency responders as well, those who go into crisis situations where life is at risk. Thank you for police, firefighters, EMTs, doctors, and nurses who serve because of the call you placed in their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Lord of all healing, we all have family members and friends who are suffering physically, emotionally, or both. We pray your healing hand on each one of them. Where there is illness, provide the cure. Where there is anxiety or depression, Provide the support necessary to overcome it or to manage it well. Where there is confusion, bring clarity. Where there is substance abuse, bring counseling, treatment, and sobriety. Watch over our elderly by providing the necessary assistance they need 
from professionals who understand the way our bodies and minds change as we age. We ask you to comfort us, Lord, in our loss. When someone we love dies, we mourn publicly for a while, but we mourn personally as long as we live. Thank you for the loved ones who have touched our lives and made us who we are today. We pray right now, Lord, in the silence of this sanctuary for those who are on our hearts right now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Provider of all we need, help us to recognize those in our homes and in our communities who are in need of love and sustenance. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. You do not change like the shifting shadows. Thank you for this past year. In all of the trials and in all of the celebrations, we thank you for the life of this last year. Watch over us as we journey through this next year. Thank you, Lord, for this worship service. May the word proclaimed here today be heeded and bring us new life in your Son, Jesus Christ.